Okay, we might get started. We might have a few more dribble in as we go along. But welcome everybody to the second part of our teacher professional learning session today. So this is part two of Can I Fall Down the Cracks? Plate Tectonics Misconceptions. So we have Lara here. Give us a wave, Lara. You got myself, Louise, and we've got our special guest here today, Dr. Jonathan Bathgates. So we wanted to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we virtually meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. We would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us for today's session. So Geoscience Australia is Australia's national geological survey and we provide geographical and geological information for the nation. Now we're just situated in Canberra, there are about 600 of us in a dedicated building. So Louise and I belong to the education team and here are just four photos that are describing what we do. So the top one there left is the bread and butter of what we do, having school kids come to visit us on site. And here's a student putting some sediment into the columns. And every group that comes puts a layer in and that's then our visitor book, our record of visits to the education centre. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were getting up to 13,000 a year. Uh, on the right hand side, top right, we've got a picture of the, the main area in the education centre there with the big wall. And that time scale underneath the bench there is two scale, it's 4.6 metres long. Bottom right is an example of some of the rocks that we have. So that's the igneous rocks bench. So we have lots of rocks that kids can pick up and turn around and, and, and examine in person. And bottom left there is an example of some of the resources that we have both printed and downloadable from our website. Okay, so we know that probably most of you are, who are here today joined us last week as well. So we're not going to cover the same ground that we did on misconceptions that we covered last week. So if you weren't here last week, we did watch a short video on some scientific misconceptions and people's attitudes when those misconceptions were challenged by science. Uh, we'll provide the link to this video in the resources that we provide at the end of the session. So if you haven't seen this video before and want to check it out, we recommend it. The reason we showed this video, and you probably saw this quote last time if you were here, was that, sorry, I'm just doing waiting room stuff as we speak here, was that this done some studies on misconceptions and they found that if students have a misconception, it's very hard to just teach over the top of it. So if they already think they understand something, it's very hard to replace that belief unless you acknowledge that there's a misconception. So that's what we're looking to do in last week's session and in this session as well, is address directly some of the misconceptions around plate tectonics. And the misconceptions this week will be focusing on hazards to do with plate tectonics. So I'll first one here. This is really, really common. It's saying that earthquakes are measured using the Richter scale. Not quite. Here's a picture of the, the Richter scale and a book published by. Sorry, can you hear me now? Here's a picture of the Richter scale uh, as uh, published in Richter's book from 1958. And here, all you can see it really is just a mathematical device which was creating a magnitude from the logarithm of the amplitude of the seismic waves in that recording. Uh, but this has no basis in, in physics or in the physical properties of the crust. The data had to be collected by a Wood Anderson instrument. Here's a lovely picture of one here. The seismograph had to be 100 kilometers or less away from the earthquake, and it didn't work for earthquakes that were magnitude seven or over, the, the, the accuracy dropped off. Having said that, modified Richter scale is used here in Australia. So there's a, a coefficient that would be there's added a, to the a coefficient that would be added to. Sorry, I heard an echo on myself there. That was weird. Uh, and you can see the, here three different geological zones that are used in, in Australia, um, and so that would then have three separate different equations. And if you want to talk about, uh, want to learn more about uh, the work that we do on community safety and earthquakes, there is a link there on our website. Another really good useful resource in the classroom is this lovely video. It goes for five and a half minutes on YouTube and it's entitled, What Happened to the Richter Scale? And it's by people from the US called Iris. Uh, and just, I'll, I'll make a quick note here. All of these links will be available in a resource you can download at the end of this. We'll give you the link at the end. 
So the moment magnitude scale is really what we should be talking about. And the moment magnitude scale is based on the physical properties of the fault. And we have the three bits there. So there's the rigidity of the, the crust where the earthquake occurred, the average displacement of the fault and the ruptures dimensions. In other words, the length by width giving the area. And you can see there the slip on that diagram. And that diagram is available in our earthquakes booklet. To break that down further, so the moment itself is m subscript naught equals mu, which is the rigidity of the rock, times d, which is that distance that the rock slipped, times the area, which is the full fault zip, a fault zone that slipped, sorry, and that is that, if we were to, to put that in, that's actually hidden there. So just to give some numbers, so if we were to go back to the magnitude 2.9 that was felt near Adelaide in February 2017, that represents two centimetres of slip. So not very much slip, but it was 250 by 250 metres that slipped on that zone. If we then go up to a magnitude 6, we're talking about square kilometres. So this table at the bottom there is from that uh, link down the bottom there, the um, Seismology Research Centre, uh, and that table what I wanted to take away from it is that by the time you get down to the bottom of the table we're now talking about rectangular rupture dimensions rather than circular or square which is more how we seem to depict them in textbooks and on websites but this is the gold standard the centroid moment tensor there's a link down there if you want to read more about it or you can look at this lovely screenshot here of some beautiful mathematics essentially if we were to use a fancy computer, a big supercomputer, and we could model all the various ways in which earthquakes could occur, and this is an example of some of the tensors you might be looking at, and then you look at the seismograms that will be produced from those various earthquakes, we can then make comparisons between a received signal and that library of potentials to work out what happened during the earthquake, and it gets a gold ribbon. The take home message from all of this, same magnitude, try not to say Richter. Uh, the media is very good at using the word Richter. We shall enforce the word magnitude. Next one. Magnitude of an earthquake depends on how far away it is. Mm, not quite. So there's a difference between magnitude and intensity. And here's a great video from uh, Noah. You can see up here, it says Noah. This is talking about the, the recent and historic earthquakes by energy release. Uh, so you can see the bottom there's a 5.8 magnitude right up to a 6.9 there. There's, there's, there's a big difference there. The thing to keep in mind here is that we're talking about the physical thing that's happening. So the right hand side picture, keep in mind. If we were to get the scientists in Japan where an earthquake was happening to measure the or calculate the magnitude, and then the scientists who got a signal here in Australia to calculate magnitude, they will both come up with the same number because it's the, it's the physical size of the earthquake. It's independent of where you take that measurement. But perhaps the students are thinking of something more like the Macaulay intensity scale. So this is a diagram out again out of our um, earthquakes booklet. And you can see that scale goes from zero to 10, where at the top, you can't really feel them at all. And the cartoon pictures are really nice at, at showing what might be happening. The bottom is total destruction. But the intensity varies with distance and geology. So this is off our website. So we have an earthquakes at GA page where you can look at earthquakes that have been recorded by Geoscience Australia, but there's also a section on there called felt reports. So if you feel an earthquake, you can either fill in a form online or make a phone call and tell our scientists what you felt at what time. So this one here is a screen capture from an earthquake that happened in May last year near Adelaide. And all of those circles there are bunches of felt reports. The stars there are, are more felt reports showing you where people have reported having felt it. You can then from that create what they call a shake map. And you can see the bottom right of that image there shows you the scale of intensity. So for this particular one, it was anywhere from weak to moderate strength of shaking. And the scientists would then use this information for ground truthing. And it helps to model what the intensity might be for a certain magnitude earthquake in that area. This is a nice one. The biggest earthquake you can get is a magnitude 10. Now maybe that's from things like these movies and these TV shows. So Hollywood's good at exaggerating things. So this was an easy one to answer. To get a magnitude 10, we'd either need a bigger earth 
or we'd need a fault line that extends around most of the earth. It's a great zip picture there. So that's coming back to that equation again. The other thing to, that you could mention is that there is actually no limit to the magnitude scale. And the analogy might be that there is no limit to the temperature scale. So recently I had a student who was adamant that I had to answer the question but what if there was a 10 but what what if there was a 10 it didn't seem to matter what I said until finally I talked about the mathematics and so this is a grade six student where they've already studied area and so I said okay if you had a box or a rectangle that was 10 by 2 what would the area be and luckily the whole group all said it would be 20 and I said but could it be 22 and they said no well, if that term is then part of the calculation for the area for the, the magnitude of an earthquake, there is no way unless that area was bigger that we could get a bigger magnitude. And that seemed to satisfy them using some nice maths. Here's our guest presenter, and it's not the rock, but there is a good question there. Rock is saying, I can predict earthquakes. Jonathan, what do you have to um, I think he might be uh, overstating it just a, just a little bit. Um, uh, this is a, a common miscon misconception and, and one that um, I often get um, when we're dealing with uh, media interviews after there is an earthquake. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've just had an earthquake and the question always comes, well, is, is this a precursor to, what, to another a bigger earthquake or, you know, what can we expect into the future? So this brings us to earth earthquake prediction. Um, and and we sort of have to think about what we mean when we say prediction. Um, and generally what people think about is a prediction is something that happens at a certain time in a, at a certain place. Um, and that is at the moment something that we can't do with earthquakes. So we can't tell you that there's going to be an earthquake at a particular place at a certain time and how big that earthquake could be. Um, but what we can do um, and what we're moving towards is, is earthquake forecasting and earthquake early warning. So um, the, the map on the, the left, on the bottom left of your screen there is the National Seismic Hazard Assessment map for Australia. Um, and that is basically based on recorded seismicity that we've, that we've had in Australia over the last um, 100 or so years that we've been recording earthquakes around the country. So the, as you can see there, there's a few zones um, in Australia that are more active than others. So we have the Southwest Seismic Zone in, in Western Australia um, that basically has uh, half of our recorded earthquakes every year um, happen in, South, in Western Australia. Um, there's another active area in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. And then in the Gippsland region of Victoria is also very active. So, you know, in terms of forecasting, we can say that these areas are places that we commonly get earthquakes in Australia. So that's a, that's a type of forecast. Um, another type is um, if we get a, a very large earthquake and we have an aftershock sequence, um, we can forecast that there are likely to be more earthquakes to follow that event. We can't say whether that there will be bigger ones in that sequence, but generally what happens, um, there's a law called Amori's law which basically says after a, a main shock, you will have a sequence of aftershocks that uh, decrease in frequency and magnitude over time. So it's a, that's a kind of an earthquake forecast. And then that leads us to earthquake early warning. So this is a, an advancement that really is enabled through um, advancements in our technology and our ability to communicate. So, um, essentially what we have around the country is a network of seismometers as we do in Australia, we've got about 100 seismometers across the country, but in some areas of the world where earthquake hazard is, is um, a very significant um, hazard for the country, like the Western US and places like Japan, um, they have far denser seismic networks, so many more seismic seismometers than we have in Australia. Um, and what they can do with that is essentially if they when they detect that first uh, earthquake arrival wave, the P wave, which travels at about eight kilometers a second, they can do a, a very quick assessment on the size of, of that wave and transmit that information to the uh, communities before the seismic waves actually arrive there. So the, um, the S waves um, travel at about 300 kilometers, uh, three and a half kilometers a second or the, and the surface waves, which do, generally do the damage. So we can get the signals to the communities before those seismic waves arrive there and cause the damage. And that gives people um, precious 
time to prepare themselves and critical infrastructure. So things like train lines, um, power stations, they can all take measures to mitigate any damage. So maybe the next slide we can go to. Um, so given that, um, these precious seconds that we can potentially now give people, um, what do you do with that? Um, and another mis common misconception around earthquakes is what you do when you when you start to feel shaking. Um, one is standing in a doorway. Um, one is you you run out into a, a clear space where there is where, where you're not inside a building. But um, from these images, you can see here a, a lot of the debris um, falls off the front of a building during an earthquake and lands on the on the footpath out the front. So if you were to run outside of a building during shaking, it's uh, quite possibly uh, that you'll get hit by some of this falling debris. And, and that is generally where a lot of the casualties and, and injuries happen during earthquakes of people running outside of the building. So a, a better rule is to drop cover and hold. So drop to the floor while the shaking, uh, when the shaking begins, get under something sturdy like a table and hold onto that until the shaking stops. Um, and something that happens every year is something called the Great Shakeout, which is an earthquake drill that you can sign up to um, at that website. It occurs on the 21st of October. Um, and you can sign up your school um, and do an earthquake drill um, with many other countries around the world participating in this. So it's a, it's a good way of uh, getting some awareness of what people should do in earthquakes, because it's not just um, earthquakes occurring in Australia, it's people traveling overseas um, and uh, experiencing earthquakes in much more earthquake prone um, locations than Australia. So next slide. Um, so how do we how do we record earthquakes? So um, technology has come a long way in the 100 or so years that we've been recording earthquakes in Australia. Um, people have been recording earthquakes far longer than that, of course. So some of the, the images you can see there in the, in the top left are very primitive um, early seismometers where a, a ball would drop out from one of those dragons into one of the one of the frog's mouths and that would tell you which direction the earthquake occurred. But um, we've put seismometers on the moon, we've recorded on smoke paper, we've recorded on thermal paper, but now we're all digital. So the next slide shows you what we where we're currently at with uh, the, the latest technology of seismometers and this is called a raspberry shake. Um, it's a very low cost seismometer that you can purchase uh, for your school. Um, it's le less than $1,000. Um, it's about the size of a Rubik's cube and you can record earthquakes uh, and your students can see um, real data and you can participate in a, a network of, of seismometers that record earthquakes globally and feed data back into warning centers and uh, national earthquake alert centers like we have here at Geoscience Australia. So um, that's just one. There are, there are many other um, low cost seismometers that, that people can you can purchase and, and participate in uh, earthquake recording. But that's that's where, where we're at now. Um, and I think I'll pass back to back to the team to continue. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. That was fantastic. So we're going to take a bit of a sidestep away from earthquakes now. We've discussed a few misconceptions about earthquakes. And so our next misconception we're going to discuss is we don't get volcanoes in Australia. So to start us off, I'm just going to start by sharing a video. So if we just get out the PowerPoint there, wonderful. So this is a video that you might have seen in shape or form recently in the media. So this is drone footage from a volcano that has been erupting in Iceland the last week or two. And you can see it's quite spectacular footage to show. So we have been showing this to students and we get all the oohs and the ahs that you'd expect from showing such footage, but it's often followed by the comment, if we go back to our slides, that, but yeah, we don't get volcanoes in Australia. And they are right, we don't get anything that looks quite like Iceland in Australia just there. So just let us get back to our... There we go, wonderful. So if we don't get volcanoes in Australia, 
what is this? So this is a photograph of Big Ben on Heard Island, which is an Australian territory. And this is an active volcano. So you can see on the map, it's not particularly close to Australia, which is why a lot of people aren't aware of it. It is actually more close to the coast of Antarctica than it is to the coast of Australia. So then we often get people revising their statements and saying, oh yes, but we have no volcanoes on mainland Australia. So let's have a look at our mainland Australia map. So what we've got shown here are volcanoes in mainland Australia. Now, obviously this obviously gets followed up with the comment of, yeah, but there's no active volcanoes on mainland Australia, which is generally what people mean when they say we don't get volcanoes in Australia. So let's have a little bit of a further look into, oh yeah, sorry, that's the, um, the statement from Geoscience Australia as well, the official statement is that mainland Australia has no active volcanoes and we have this written in our education centre as well. So this is, you know, not a bad line to go with. But what about recent Australian eruptions? So we have here three photos of what we call mountains in South Australia that were originally volcanoes. So we got Mount Moorhead, Mount Shank and Mount Gambia. So scientists knew that these were all volcanoes and they did dating that showed they all erupted about 5,000 years ago. So this sounds like a very long time ago, but if you of course recall that the Aboriginal history in Australia extends back to best estimates now are 65,000 years, you'll realize that this is well within human memory. There are oral traditions and stories from the local Aboriginal people that lived in this area of South Australia that tell of an ancestor or a giant and his family who are looking for a place to live. They started at Mount Moyhead. They then were scared away by a moaning spirit and they moved to Mount Shank. But then the same thing happened there and they moved again to Mount Gambia. So as well as this um, oral history sort of supporting what we know about the volcanoes erupting at this time in South Australia, they've actually also used these histories to tell us what order the volcanoes were erupting in. So the dating that the scientists were doing on these volcanoes could limit them. We all knew they were roughly around the same time, but it wasn't precise enough to say which volcano erupted first and which one erupted last. So they were able to combine the knowledge from dating, from the traditional knowledge to get a greater understanding of what happened in this region. So how do we define active now? So there's different ways that different scientists like to define what an active volcano is. So one of these ways is by age. So they say that young volcanism is considered to be anything less than 10,000 years. So if we use that definition, Mount Gambia and Mount Shank, as we said, erupted only 5,000 years ago, so they would be considered active by this definition. And the same with northeastern Queensland, where there's other volcanoes that have erupted within the last 10,000 years. Another way to define active is by area. So there's some areas of long lived volcanic activity. In these areas, the volcanoes themselves might be extinct, but the areas, the areas or the provinces can still be considered active. So if we use this definition, then this chunk of southwestern Victoria, which is known by the newer volcanics province, would fall into the category of active. So this province has been active for the last 4.5 million years, with eruptions occurring about once every 10,000 years. So what should we tell students about active volcanoes in Australia? So we're not really suggesting that you go off and tell them that lava is going to pour down the streets of Melbourne anytime soon, although there has been some studies and some articles looking into how likely this is to happen. But we suggest that maybe you could use this as an opportunity to incorporate some of the cross-curricular priorities into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures uh, when you're talking about volcanoes, because although they're not recent or active in a lot of ways that we think about now, they definitely have occurred within human memory. Okay, so our final misconception for today is you can surf a tsunami. So this image here is one you might have seen before. This also often is considered sort of the classic tsunami image. So this one was done by a Japanese artist in the 1800s, this image here. 
Uh, so the thing with this image though, is that there is nothing from that time or place that actually said that this was considered to be a tsunami wave. This was a, a modern Western interpretation of this image. And scholars think that this is more likely to actually just show a rogue wave. So this lovely cresting shape is probably not showing a tsunami at all. But this shape of wave has continued on into popular culture. So this image here is taken from a wonderful video called Tsunami, amazing Photoshop pictures of extra, extra large waves. But you've probably seen similar images if you've seen any disaster movies that involve tsunamis. So you can see we've got that nice cresting shape to the wave. And you can imagine if you look at this, why kids might think this would be a great wave to set to surf. Okay, so what a tsunami actually looks like is determined by how they're formed. So we've got a short video here to show you. So Lara's just going to press play on that one for us. So you're going to see we've got two plates at a subduction zone. One is going to go underneath the other. And often the kids will be aware of this as the mechanism for which tsunamis are formed. So you see we've got the pressure building up between the plates, which is suddenly released. A Eurasian plate pops back up and it also displaces all the water on top of it, giving us the tsunami. So you see that this animation ends with trough first and crest first being shown here. So this links into another misconception or idea that you might have heard about tsunamis. That is, if you're standing at the beach and a tsunami is coming, you will see the water retreating first. And this is called drawback. So that is true if you are on the side of the subduction zone that is labelled trough first. So it's to do with the geometry of those plates and which one is subducting under which. However, if you're on the other side of the subduction zone, you won't see this drawback at all. You would just be met with that wall of water that we're going to see in a minute. So this clip that we just showed you of that video was taken from a longer video off our YouTube channel. So the video is called Tsunami Caused by Earthquakes and it's almost three minutes long. It includes a lot more explanations. And the video goes on to show what happens when that wave reaches the coastline as well. You'll see that it is part of the Education Center YouTube playlist. And you'll notice there's a few other tsunami videos there as well. So we've got tsunamis caused by landslides, tsunamis caused by volcanic sources, uh, and there's a whole range of different geoscience videos on that channel. So if you haven't seen it already, I'd suggest you check it out. So we're not going to watch all the videos for all the ways we can form tsunamis. We're going to move through these a little bit faster. Um, but these images are from our Tsunami Teachers resource book. So again, this is a downloadable resource. We'll provide you the link and you can use these images and the information that goes with them in your teaching. So you see we've got landslides can displace not only land, but the water above them if they happen underwater. Another way tsunamis can form is through volcanic eruptions. So there's a few different ways this can happen. So there's a few different pictures here to demonstrate this, but either the magma displacing the water as it erupts underwater is one way, but also one that maybe you wouldn't think of so much is if you have an underwater volcano that collapses to form a caldera or if it was on surface or on land we would call it a crater and that cratering causes a tsunami as well as the water above it sinks in with the land and this one might surprise you to be told that this image is not from our tsunami booklet but this is actually an image from the movie deep impact so this is showing a tsunami being formed by a meteorite impact so this is another mechanism that can form tsunamis in real life as well but as you can see, this is a very high quality movie. Oceans rise, cities fall, but hope survives. So now we know about how tsunamis are formed. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how they're different to normal waves. So our top picture there shows us normal ocean waves that we would see every day if we go to the beach. So in these waves, you'll notice that we've got the wavelength marks, so the distance between the peaks of the different waves, and it's about 10 meters on average. The water in those waves is moving in a circular motion as well, and the energy of those waves doesn't extend to the seafloor. It's uh, relatively shallow and contained to the surface. If we compare that to our tsunami wave diagram below, you see that the entire water column is displaced by that, uh, whether it's plate movement or landslide, whatever causes it, the entire water column is moving. 
and our wavelength of the wave is much, much longer. So for comparison, these are not to scale at all, for comparing one to the other, because we're talking in kilometers on that bottom diagram. So 100 kilometers wavelength compared to only 10 meters on the top one. So not only do we have the entire water column uh, moving in this kind of tsunami wave, we've also got it moving, if you think about it, in a straight direction. So we haven't got any of that circular motion for the energy either. So what does that mean when a tsunami or a wave approaches the shore? So our top diagram showing us a normal wave means that the energy in the water is moving in a circular motion and the wave will crest and crash. So this is the kind of wave we can surf. We get those nice faces on the waves and we get that nice cresting. Uh, if we compare that to a tsunami, we get something quite different when they reach the shore. So our water is flowing straight in. We don't get that circular motion and we don't get the cresting. So another graphic showing what happens when a tsunami does approach the shore. So we've got those huge long wavelength waves moving towards the shore. The friction of the wave on the seabed causes the wave to catch up with itself. So the front of the wave starts to slow down. So the back of the wave starts to catch up with it. And the result of this is the wavelength gets shorter. But this also means that the wave gets taller. So what could be a relatively small wave at the ocean grows in size as it comes into shore. So we're going to jump out again now and watch a video. So this is one that we do show to the students at times because it's quite a nice little animation. So this is a video called The Boxing Day Tsunami. It was produced by the BBC. I'm going to have to move you out the way so I can make it full screen. Deep under the Indian Ocean, two tectonic plates have been pushing against each other for hundreds of years. The edges of these plates were locked together, building enormous stresses and bending the upper plate like a giant spring. And on Boxing Day 2004, this pressure reached breaking point. It happened with such enormous power that it was a mega thrust event. The fault started to rupture, shooting upwards by as much as 40 feet. At twice the speed of a bullet, the plates unzipped over a distance of more than 750 miles. It lifted the seabed and the entire ocean above. Billions of tonnes of seawater, forced upward by the movement of the seabed, now flowed away from the fault. On the surface, the displaced water fanned out as a series of giant ripples. The tsunami began to travel at up to 500 miles per hour. And so what triggered the Boxing Day tsunami was no ordinary earthquake. It was a rare megathrust earthquake that had set in motion this wave of destruction. Okay, so as we get back to our PowerPoint slides there, I'll tell you why we quite like that video. So obviously it's a nice animation of how the wave is formed at the subduction zone. But we also really like that it ends with that wave of water coming towards you, or I should say really the wall of water, because we see something that looks more like this. So this is a real photo or real series of photos from the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004 that was being described in the video. And you see there that we're not getting a cresting wave that's rising over the buildings and the trees. We're getting this wall of water that's racing in. And I'm not a surfer, but I'm told that surfers would call it this kind of water white water. And it's notoriously difficult to control your board when you're in white water because it's very turbulent. And in the case of tsunami is going to contain a lot of debris as well. So we do have at Geoscience Australia here, it's not all doom and gloom when it comes to tsunamis. We have our Joint Australian Tsunami Warning Centre. So this is a photo of it here that was taken today through the window. So that's a 
a real-time almost photo of what they do here. So in this centre, they are monitoring earthquakes. So as Jonathan said, it's difficult to predict when earthquakes are going to happen, but once one does happen, the scientists that work in the warning centre are trying to predict whether the earthquake will go on to form a tsunami. So there's several criteria they need for an earthquake to form a tsunami. It needs to be magnitude six and a half or more. It needs to be a relatively shallow earthquake, so it happens at a depth of 100 kilometres or less. And finally, the most obvious one is that it needs to happen either underwater or very close to water in order to displace a large wave. So they use this information to warn people in our region about tsunamis that could arrive. But the warning centres don't always have the desired effect. So there is a story that from the Japan earthquake that happened in 2011, that a tsunami warning was issued. And it was issued to people in Hawaii and in California because that wave travelled across the Pacific to the USA. But unfortunately, instead of triggering people to move away from the coast, this tra uh, attracted some people to move towards the coast. And we had some photographers that were washed away on the Californian coast by the tsunami that originated in Japan. So not only are tsunamis not good for surfing, we don't recommend you try and photograph them either. All right. So, Going back to our, our children here, we've got the misconception. So we had the earthquakes uh, measured using the Richter scale. The magnitude of an earthquake depends on how far away it is. You can surf a tsunami. We don't get volcanoes in Australia. The biggest earthquake you can get is a magnitude 10. And the rock saying, I can predict earthquakes. But after our talk now, the children know that the science says, the same magnitude for the size of an earthquake, not Richter. The magnitude of an earthquake is independent of how far away it is. Tsunamis are walls of water, not surfing waves. The first Australian saw volcanoes erupt. There is no upper limit to magnitude, but it's unlikely we'll ever get a magnitude 10. And the rock now knows earthquakes are very difficult to predict. Okay, so we are gonna go over to Talk to Jonathan for questions very shortly. So we're going to ask that you put those in the chat now as we go along. Um, Lara's going to run us through some of the classroom resources that we haven't already discussed in the session. And hopefully by the time we get to the end of those, we'll have some questions for Jonathan to address. So if there's anything you'd like to ask Jonathan while he's here, just pop it in the chat now. So the first one is this amazing thing called Tsunami, the Ultimate Guide. So the, the link is down the bottom there. It's a large resource. There are plenty of videos, slideshows, uh, lots of information, very Australia focused. Uh, we have actually had uh, Geoscience Australia scientists contribute to this. So, so we are um, going, to, going to push that one quite hard in that sense. But it is a, a very, very useful resource. Um, put some time aside to scroll through everything that is there. This one's a really nice one. It's from NOAA in, in the US. Uh, it's a browser run resource where you can uh, put in all different sorts of bits and pieces on the left hand side there. And they're all mapped in a GIS style of, uh, of layout there. Can't leave you without spruiking our own bits and pieces. This is our classroom resource teacher notes and student activities. So each of these three booklets, and it's only three of a suite, uh, have a textbook at the start that is aimed at school teacher level material and then at the back there are student activities including worked answers so these are downloadable in pdf form on our website we talked earlier about the Macaulay intensity scale so our friends at earth learning idea in the uk have a nice activity where you can change it to what would it be if feel like if there was an earthquake in the classroom. And you can see there's just a, a snippet of it. So you can move the table and you can have things falling off tables and benches and cupboards shaking. And at the very bottom, uh, all of the buildings around you have fallen down, but help is on its way, it's okay. This one's a nice one as well um, from the USGS is a pop-out calculator so that you can compare two earthquakes. Here I've got the 6.3, from Christchurch and magnitude nine from Japan, both from 2011. Uh, the anniversary of those two was, was in the last month or so. And you can see that the, the difference in the energy release between those two as calculated here is 11,000. This is a nice activity to do. 
And the last one is one of many, many, many pages on the USGS's website, but we liked it because it had earthquake facts and earthquake fantasy. This is harking back to uh, San Andreas movie. Again, a site that uh, you should dedicate a lot of time to looking through if you want to find lots and bits and pieces. Uh, and now I think we should hand back. What questions do we have? Hey, did you want to start off by introducing yourself at all, Jonathan, saying a bit about what you do, or do you want to leap straight into questions? Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, the Director of Observatory Operations and Data here at GA, and now a Community Safety Branch. Um, so uh, I started out at Geoscience Australia as a duty seismologist in the National Earthquake Alert Centre. Um, and now as part of my role, I um, operate the national uh, seismograph network that, um, that we run to, to monitor earthquakes and feed into that alert centre. So we have about 100 sites across the country and um, we sort of uh, make sure that um, the Earthquake Alert Centre has enough data to be able to uh, monitor for earthquakes in Australia. Um, and provide that tsunami warning function along with the Bureau of Meteorology for, for Australia. Great. Okay, we'll move to our first question. I'll start with one that you'd probably love to answer. What is the cause of earthquakes in Australia? Yes, so that's a, a, an interesting question because Australia is a little bit different to what we've been talking about in terms of the, the plate tectonics and the plate boundaries. So um, Australia has uh, basically sits in the centre of a tectonic plate um, and we get what we call intraplate earthquakes. So earthquakes that occur within the, the tectonic plate as opposed to those that occur, occur at the plate boundaries. So places like Indonesia and New Zealand and Japan, they all sit very close to to the plate boundaries and they get these very large earthquakes or potentially very large earthquakes that occur on the plate boundaries. Um, so in Australia, um, we get earthquakes generally because our plate is moving very quickly. It's one of the fastest moving tectonic plates um, at about seven to eight centimetres every year to the north east. Um, and then it obviously collides with the plates um, that it's uh, in the surrounding areas. So. Um, that imparts stresses, so those collisions um, impart stresses that are fed back into the plate and activate fault lines within the, the tectonic plate. So those are the earthquakes that, that we tend to get in Australia, so activated local fault lines. Um, and then um, going moving on to, to Shona's question, which kind of relates to this um, about what is the biggest earthquake and and, and what could we experience as, as a potentially potential largest earthquake? Um, so that the largest one we have had is in uh, or have on record that we've recorded is in occurred in Tennant Creek in 1988, um, and there was two. Uh, earthquakes of, of more than magnitude six in a very short period of time in 1988 at Tennant Creek. So um, we can get large earthquakes. In fact, there was a, a magnitude 6.1 earthquake in Central Australia in 2016. So we, we do get magnitude sixes in Australia um, on average uh, about once every 20 years. But um, of course, that uh, we can get them more frequently than that, because um, we have a very short period of actually monitoring for earthquakes in Australia. So we, we had our first seismometer in Australia in the early 1900s. Um, so prior to that, we really have a, um, a sparse knowledge of what has occurred. And we have a program of, of looking at old fault lines and trying to work out what has moved and, and when that was and how big they were. So the largest earthquake is, is a Bit of an unknown for Australia, and it's it's a and it's certainly an area of research, but it it could potentially uh, go up into the magnitude sevens. Okay, great. Following on from that, do you know what the highest tsunami that we have evidence for in Australia might be? Uh, that's a, another good question, and and one that is also a little bit controversial, um, and I I don't know the answer to that. Um, we do have records of, of tsunami in Australia um, from an earthquake that occurred in Java in, I think it may have been 2007. Um, we did have tsunami inundation on the Australian West Coast um, at Steep Point, um, which certainly 
uh, washed away or uh, demolished a campsite of some people that were camping on the beach there. Um, they were able to get to high ground, but we do have evidence of tsunami inundation in Australia. Um, there is uh, a line of research of people looking at um, potential tsunami deposits on the Australian east coast, some very large boulders that appear on, on the top of cliffs that probably shouldn't be there. But again, that's, that's a, an area of, of a little bit contentious and an area of active research. Great. And we have a question asking, was Australia ever closer to a plate boundary? Um, that's an interesting question. So that's, I guess, depending on uh, the sea levels um, at, at any point in time. So um, I, I guess not. So the, the, the plate boundaries uh, have evolved over, over time. So as we know, the, the plates have not always been as they are today. Um, so we've broken up from, from some very large sort of mega plates and, and uh, worked our way to, to what we know as the plate boundaries as they are today. Um, but uh, in terms of recent history, I guess um, the plate boundaries have been as they are now for, for uh, well, ever since uh, humans have been, been in Australia, I guess. Okay, great. We have a couple of questions about the cause of volcanoes in Australia. I know that's probably a little bit outside your particular area of expertise. Is that something you'd be comfortable to talk to? Um, I can talk a little bit about it, I guess. So um, uh, there's there's different forms of volcanoes. So um, as we know that the tectonic plates are moving, um, we have convection currents within the mantle of the earth. Um, and often that we get things called hotspots where these mantle plumes are reaching up to the surface. Um, what can happen um, is when the tectonic plates move across one of these hotspots, you get volcanism um, that, that breaks through the surface and you get active volcanism. So that's there's some evidence of that in Australia. Um, uh, what, the other forms of volcanism are at the plate boundaries, like in, in New Zealand, um, places like that in Japan, um, where you get these very, very large earthquakes due to um, the melting of the subducted slab um, that is very buoyant and breaks through through to the surface and you get these chains of volcanoes. Um, so um, it's uh, that, that's probably where I would I would leave that. So we do have evidence of, of volcanism in Australia, and, and some of that evidence is due to hotspots where the Australian plate has moved along across the top of the hotspot. Okay, great. We have a question about if there's any modelling for rising sea levels and tsunamis in Australia, and if so, are there any ways or precautions to address this? Um, not that I'm aware of in relation to rising sea levels. Um, it, uh, what, what we tend to do for tsunami modelling in Australia is take the, the worst case scenarios. So, you know, we, we assume that uh, a tsunami is going to arrive at the coastline where, where the, the, the tides are high. So, um, and we basically model our worst case scenarios so we, we can warn on the, on the worst case. But I'm not aware of any um, tsunami modeling that is, uh, is done taking into consideration any climate change. Yeah. Okay, it's reading a longer question here. Well, this one might be, I'll see how we go, but this one might be a bit, um, bit of a strange one for you to answer. So the comment is that in the syllabus for New South Wales for Earth and Environmental Science, there's a dot point that it is rumoured to be incorrect. We don't know exactly what is incorrect about it. So can you hear anything in this statement that sounds overtly wrong, I guess? That is, describe the role of heat and its interactions with the lithosphere in creating different types of volcanic eruptions and magma compositions, including partial melting of subducted oceanic plates resulting explosive felsic eruptions. So anything particular controversial you can hear there? Um, it's probably getting a little bit out of my area, but um, maybe it's something that we can look into and, and run past a few people here. But um, it is it, certainly the, the type of volcanic eruption is certainly by, uh, dependent on the type of rock and the type of magma. So um, a uh, a volcano that is occurring underneath a, uh, a 
the continental part of, of the crust is, is different to what you get in the oceanic part. So um, it's, it's certainly we could we could take this offline and maybe um, uh, get back to, to Emily with, with uh, an answer on that one. Yeah, absolutely. If for that question, or if there's any others that we haven't touched on that you'd like particular answers to that we might be able to research and get back to you, you can shoot those through to us at education at ga.gov.au. Uh, is there any more questions before we wrap up? Let me give it 10 seconds in the chat, but I think we might have, oh, we got a thank you, that's good. <laughs> okay. All right, if there's no more questions for Jonathan, we will move on to a little thank you slide. So thank you very much for joining us today, everybody. Uh, we're going to put some links into the chat for you now. So the first one I'm going to chuck in now is our Survey Monkey link. So if you could mosey on over and complete that on your way out, that would be fantastic. The next two links are links to the resources that we have mentioned in the session. The first link is going to be the resources for part one, if you were present in that session. And the second link, which I'm just copying across now, are the resources that we have mentioned today. So more to do with hazards. Okay. All right, we have lots of thank yous for everyone. So thank you very much, Jonathan. We really appreciate your expertise today. And thank you to everyone who has attended.